Hi guys, it's your faculty. I am back again with another new series of discussions. In a series of previous videos, I did discuss with you about uh, different important personalities who have played a big role in India's independence. Now, in this series of uh, videos over the next couple of days, we'll be covering Viceroys of India. See, from uh, 1857 onwards, India remained under the Viceroys. After the Crown actually took over power in India, Crown retained viceregal system of government. Now, Viceroy was actually appointed more like the ceremonial head of India. And uh, that was supposed to be an additional job on top of the governor general now governor general was to be the representative of the parliament viceroy was to be the representative of the british crown given that from 1858 india was under the crown rule now there were many viceroys Everybody had their own contributions. There were some very good viceroys. There were friendly viceroys. They were unfriendly viceroys. There were uh, politically complicated viceroys as well. Now, for example, um, Lord Lytton, Lord Curzon remain possibly the most controversial viceroys that we have ever seen. Whereas many others were good viceroys like Canning, uh, Mayo, Elgin, Lansdowne, Northbrook, they've all done different, different benefits for the country. Most of India today is actually a gift of these viceroys, their relentless effort to establish a mechanism for the government of India. Today, let us begin discussion on different viceroys. And one of the first viceroys of India was Lord Canning. Canning was the Viceroy of India from 1858 to 1862. Previously, Canning has been the Governor General of the East India Company. So he was somebody who was who, who played an important role in actually ending the um, uh, 1857 revolt. During Canning's period, Government of India Act 1858 was passed and uh, also the position the post of viceroy was established now it was also decided that the viceroy was to be the same person as the governor general the governor general was to do the political jobs the viceroy was to do the ceremonial jobs as the representative of queen victoria lord canning one of his first activities on the first of november 1858 was the declaration of Darbar. He conducted the Allahabad Darbar on the 1st of November 1858, informing the world and informing India that Queen Victoria <coughs> has assumed direct control of India. This Queen's proclamation is also outlined, basically outlined, the principles by which India would be ruled in future, as well as the British policy. In fact, here when I say British, the Crown's policy, the Parliament's policy towards India, towards India and people living in the British Indian territories and their princes. Now, the Queen's proclamation clearly said that all of East India Company's treaties Agreements which have been signed with the princely nations were to be upheld and honored in full. <clears throat> the former East India Company's boundaries and borders were not to be expanded. That means the newly coming uh, Crown government was not going to go for expansions and attacking Indian princes. Also, it was categorically declared that there was going to be no encroachments on British possessions in India. 
and the British will not intrude on the territories of others. In fact, Queen's proclamation also declared that the native prince's rights, dignity, honor were to be treated as that of the Queen's herself. And also, the Queen's proclamation or the, the Government of India Act 1858, which eventually it became, expressed a wish for British subjects to enjoy wealth and social growth. Now, British subjects here basically included Indians as well. Now, also, Canning was well known to have said that such wealth and growth can only be achieved via internal peace and good governance. Canning also declared that uh, British were obliged to, to inhabitants of India and Indian regions in the same way that the British government is obliged to its people in Britain. Admission to government services, at least on paper it was declared, guys, that admission to government services and offices was to be done without any um, disregard or without any disrepute to race or faith. Except for those who had personally participated in the murder of British subjects. Everyone who got involved in 1857 were to be given general amnesty. In fact, they were given general amnesty. Other than those who were involved in murders of British subjects, people were given general amnesty. In fact, the proclamation of 1858 famously dubbed as Magna Carta of People of India. <clears throat> the beauty was it was declared in such eloquent style to be in accordance with Queen's guidance, policy of justice and religious tolerance. Queen Victoria was known for her preference to justice and religious tolerance. She was not that bad as East India Company and that Principles of justice and equality and uh, religious tolerance remain central to this Magna Carta of India. On the 1st of September, some other changes were done. See, there was a big army of East India Company in India. Now, something had to be done for this army because the East India Company government has been taken over by the Crown. So, naturally, it was expected that the Crown would assume the responsibility of retaining and maintaining the company army. <clears throat> on September 1st, 1858, East India Company convened its first solemn session. First complete session. The company's armies ceased to exist after the Queen's proclamation. And soldiers in India eventually became an important part of the British Army. Indian sepoys were enlisted in the British Army's regular service. And the Indians were given full opportunity to be part of the government the east india company army was basically called the british indian army government of india 1858 was you can say the final passing of the proclamation of queen on the 2nd of august 1858 government of india act or the act for good governance that's what canning used to call it got the royal assent and uh, it got implemented on 1st of november 1858 the act also gave provisions to liquidate or basically end East India Company and uh, transfer all powers to the British Crown. That's why somebody had to represent from the Crown and that representative was Viceroy. That representative of Crown in India was Viceroy. The powers of East India Companies, you know, if you remember, um, I mean, if you've, if you've seen the Indian history, as of um, Pitts India Act later, there were, there, were, there, were, there, were, there were two set of people who were ruling India. Board of Control, which was taking care of the political functions and court of directors, who were exercising um, um, economic um, activities or economic role in India. Now, both of these were suspended as of 1st of November 1858. Instead, a separate office was created called Secretary of State for India. Obviously, this new office was created to exercise complete and total authority over Indian administration. Now, the Secretary of State was to always be a cabinet minister 
that way he would also be a responsible head so he will be responsible to the british parliament he was to be a member of the british parliament and was responsible to the british parliament so whenever british parliament felt something doubtful or something fishy about india the parliament could question the secretary of state and secretary of state was to say was to answer now secretary of state was not just an individual he was to be assisted by a council of 15 members of 15 member active council an interesting aspect is more than 50 percent of the council it must be people who have must have lived in india for at least 10 years i mean so it was not just a random council it was they were to 50 percent of the people ought to have lived in india for at least 10 years the british members of the parliament could ask questions from the secretary of state for india on matters related to indian administration in full the governor general also worked as a representative of the british government and was responsible for the day-to-day -day administration of the country so secretary of state in a way with his 15 member council sort of became like himself a legislative body for india a law making body or controlling body plus uh, for all the diplomatic jobs or ceremonial jobs of governor general of india a separate office was created called the vice regal office to work basically as a diplomat on parley with the princely state so that's the reason why same person was the governor general and viceroy governor general deals with the british provinces whereas viceroy will deal with the princely states but for british this together was india and that is why both was given to a single person so all governor general was to do the i mean he was to do the run the administration of the uh, government here whereas the princely states needed a diplomat and that was to be the viceroy that's why eventually both and both princely states and british provinces together make india that's a single person was given all the job both the officers were to be elected by the same or to be held by the same person that's the reason viceroy himself was responsible to secretary of state for india so secretary of state for india and his 15 member council who were in london they were to be taken care of viceroy government of india act eventually that's why I mean, you can say government of india act brought in a highly centralized structure of governance in india it and many historians believe that whatever changes were coming these were in reality ceremonial changes nothing substantially was changing in india to be honest nothing substantial was changing during canning's period only in 1861 indian councils act was passed with this pa with this act the governor general's council was given a fifth member called the financial member along with that an additional six to twelve members for the purpose of formulating laws so when the governor general uh, the viceroy's executive sits with six to twelve members extra it becomes a legislative body when the viceroy's executive sits only with viceroy's advisors it becomes the executive body so legislative body executive body and for the convenience of administration governor general was even given several new authorities and powers like for example <clears throat> governor general had authority now to allocate specific tasks to the members of council governor general was given the authority to allocate specific tasks to the members of the council this is what we call portfolio system we call this portfolio system it also provided for governments of bombay and madras legislative authority resulting in some amount of decentralization the government of bombay and government of madras was given a little bit of decentralization 
the next most important development during uh, Canning's period is the Indian Civil Service Act of 1861. Now, it clearly stated that any person, whether Indian or European, could be appointed to any of the officers listed in the Act's schedule if he or she had lived in India for a period of seven years. So, individual basically had to pass uh, a test in the vernacular language in which they are getting appointed and that way they could study the works. So see, the same ordinance also stated that some of the most important uh, government jobs <laughs> were actually reserved only for the covenant civil services. There were two types, covenant and uh, non covenant. Um, in a much simpler way to understand is covenant civil service is the higher civil service. Non-covenant civil service is the uh, not the higher civil service or the middle civil service. Basically, Indians were largely part of the non-covenant service. Covenant civil service was those who were only Britishers. Indians were requesting um, admission into covenant civil service at that time, but obviously, as long as scanning was uh, there, this was uh, this request was rejected. Similar at the same time. Uh, along with the Indian Councils Act, Indian High Courts Act was also passed by Lord Canning. The Act actually merged Supreme Court, Sadar Diwani Adalats, Sadar Fajdari Adalats together, as well as it allowed the Queen in London to grant letters of patent for establishment of High Court of Calcutta, High Court of Madras, and High Court of Bombay. The High Courts eventually took over the jurisdiction of the Supreme Courts. The Sadar Diwani Adalats and the Fawjdari Adalats. Now, these Sadar Adalats were originally established during the Convalescent period. Convalis and uh, Warren Hastings period. From then onwards, we had this Supreme Court Diwani Adalats. Each of the High Court, Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras, were to be consisted as uh, uh, with one Chief Justice and about 15 uh, judges, according to that. At least three regular judges, including Chief Justice had actually to be barristers, I mean, they had to be barristers. And one third of the judges had to be from the Covenant Civil Service. So quite good, uh, see, <clears throat> while judicial service was created, the state's control, the government's control has still been retained very well. The High Court of Judicature of Fort Williams was eventually established on the 1st of July, 1862, with uh, Sir Barnes Peacock as its first Chief Justice. According to the letter uh, patent issued by Queen for the establishment of High Courts. Now, the Calcutta High Court eventually became very popular, very important. And uh, uh, Justice Shambhunath Pandit was actually the first Indian judge in the, in the Calcutta High Court in 1863. So, as early as 1863 itself, we had Indians in the court. The Bombay High Court was eventually created on the August uh, 14, 1862 and uh, June 26, 1862, the Madras High Court was created. Eventually, along with these three, new um, um, I mean, patent letters were also given in 1866 for establishment of uh, high courts at uh, Northwest Frontier Provinces in Agra. The Agra uh, court was eventually moved to Allahabad in 1869 by supplementary patent letters. And, uh, in the year 2016, Allahabad High Court even celebrated 150th anniversary of its establishment. Similarly, in 1862, just before uh, Canning left, Lord Macaulay, who was previously the member of the, um, the Law Commission, uh, Judicial Member of the Council, and also the member of the uh, chairman of the law commission drew the first draft of Indian Penal Code, but it was fully completely drafted in 1860 and put into effect in 1862. 1861, the Indian Penal Code, the Codes of Civil and Criminal Procedure Codes, was completed, and uh, before 1860, it was only English criminal law which based which formed the basis for law in the judicial systems of in the British Presidency towns of Bombay, Calcutta and Madras. But eventually after independence, Pakistan also acquired the same Indian Penal Code and may call it Pakistan Penal Code, Bangladesh had Bangladesh Penal Code and so on and so forth. In fact, most of the British positions in Asia, Burma, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, they all had exactly the same 
Long uh, Canning is also known to have introduced income tax reforms during his period. Um, the first finance member of uh, Canning's uh, council or the vice versa council was actually James Wilson. He proposed three different sorts of taxes, but eventually his successor, Lane, offered only one income tax. That is, five percent income tax was imposed on incomes of five hundred or more in a year, and the government. During Canning's period, also tremendously cut military and uh, civilian expenditures, mainly to improve money. The salt charge was, however, raised, but uh, that was done. And uh, during Canning's period, only the Bengal Tenancy Act. So, a lot had happened during Canning's period. After Lord Cornwallis has left, the Bengal Rent Act of 1859 was the first tenancy regulation passed during Canning's period. The main goal was to protect the rights of the tenants while at the same time clearly clarifying or judicially clarifying the rights of the landlords so landlords the riots were having a lot of confusion bengal tenancy act basically made it very clear that farmers who had held the lands for 20 years the system is important 20 years on the same rent were believed to be entitled to this right under the act which went into effect in 1793. It was also agreed that their rent could not be increased until a court inquiry was constituted. In fact, riots got a lot of ability here. Canning's uh, vice regality is also known for tea mania. Now, this is very interesting. See, Canning had cut a lot of expenditures, but he also wanted to raise a lot of money. So, he actually liberalized land policies. Basically, he uh, made it what he called the fee simple rules. That is, anybody, any potential uh, investor could just buy land for as little as 2 rupees 80 paisa to 5 rupees per acre without having to meet any clearance. So, eventually, what happened between uh, by 1860s, there was massive investments and enormous expenditure expansion of tea farms. For growing tea in Assam because land was getting very cheap punch five rupees was the maximum most expensive land and this resulted in frenetic expansion of tea plants in Assam as well as widely anticipated tea boom what we call tea mania in fact Assam tea became so popular that uh, eventually it became one of our major exports from India tea gardens Establishment of tea gardens, sale, resale, planning, development, expansion, all that became part of the canning period. And the most popular title Lord Canning actually gained during his vice regality is Clemency Canning. See, as he said in his proclamation, until if somebody is accused of killing a Britisher, a British officer of murder, he generally gave general amnesty and clemency to all at a time when national movement was uh, about to begin his liberal and tolerant policies sort of brought you can say momentary peace in india the doctrine of lamps was repealed uh, british government also clearly mentioned that it would only intervene if there was misgovernance and once the misgovernance is fixed they will leave so british would leave even if there is a bad king in the princely state british would interfere remove the bad king then British would leave. They will not annex the territories. This was very clearly mentioned. He was given the name Clemency Canning because of his gentle and tolerant attitude. And uh, Canning left India in March 1862 and died in England a month later. Lord Elgin was actually his uh, successor. Elgin, uh, Elgin won. Eventually played a bigger role. Hey. Now, that's, a, that's the beginning of the um, Vice Voice of India series of videos, guys. Now, this Sunday, 23rd of Ma, April, at 11 a.m., do attend the Unacademy Combat. You can access the combat using the code SHRIVENAR, S-R-I-V-E-N-R. Now, combat is actually a prelims test series which gives you access to, it's, it's, number one, it's completely free. It gives you access to um, an all-India level test 
where you can actually know where you stand what's your what's your what's your preparation levels with an academy we are here to help you in your preparation and one of our major support teams is the combat do not miss it on the 23rd of april 11 am you can access combat either on your uh, system or on your phone on your app do follow me on an academy plus and uh, this is your faculty rangana and kondla signing off in this video shortly we'll be seeing the next video we'll be continuing more of the wise guys thank you guys you have a nice day bye bye